Network Dojo. Now we're going to flip over to supporting management authentications, but this time through the TACAX protocol. So this is new to this version of the lab. Uh, we didn't have TACAX before because I didn't support TACAX before, although we did have TACAX a couple versions back when we were on ACS. Uh, so as we work through this, um, these are kind of the things to know about TACAX. So we're going to need to know where to enable the service because it could be disabled potentially. We're going to potentially need to update our devices, our network devices with TACAX support. And there's an additional feature with TACAX about retiring the shared secret. So we'll look at that. Um, Potentially adding enable passwords to administrative users. There's a specific use case where you might need to do that, but I would say it's a low likelihood one, so that's why the question mark's there. Tweak TACAC service ports. This would be an optional config if they wanted you to use a different service port than default. Uh, TACAC uses port 49, but we can change that. Uh, we can uh, potentially do something called uh, create a command set to permit all commands. Although the question mark there, this is usually not needed, and I doubt it would actually uh, be needed in the lab. Uh, we're definitely going to need to talk about TACAX profiles, and then we'll create rules. So let's just kind of run through things and, and talk about them one at a time here. The good news with TACAX is that, honestly, it is very similar in terms of the process uh, that we saw with RADIUS. And so the process that we go through to authenticate something with TACAX very similar to Radius where we, we have the network device check, we're assigned to a policy set, we go through the authentication process, and then we go through the authorization process. So that's the same. We're going to see a lot of the same elements in use or some very common corollary elements to what we see. So uh, it's going to look very familiar to the Radius world. But let's start running through things. So uh, the first thing, making sure the TACAC service is actually enabled because, again, it could be disabled. We're going to go into our system deployment, click into our server. And I showed you this in a previous video, but uh, it is down here. So these are the services that are going to run on this server. Most of these are just hard coded on because it's a standalone uh, server and these are required to run, but this one is not. So uh, by default, it would be unchecked. Maybe it's checked, maybe it's not. Uh, it's something worth checking here. Uh, turn it on and hit save. Now we can support TACAX on this server. Uh, our network devices. If you didn't do this already when you originally created your network devices, or maybe you haven't created the network devices yet, um, it's the similar setup as we do with Radius, but there's just a separate section for TACAX service. So I, I've already done this on this particular device here. Uh, but we just need to say, yes, I want to support TACAX from this network device. We're going to put in the shared secret, which should match the shared, shared secret used uh, at the network device level as well. Uh, but then we get this retire option here, and if we hold our mouse over the, the information, retiring a shared secret will allow both the new and the old retired shared secret for requests from the default device. This eases the transition when we're updating shared secrets. So if we ever need to update a shared secret uh, to something new, you know, every year maybe you, you update your shared secrets, um, this allows you to you know, that, that act of, okay, well, I need to update the shared secret on the device, but I also need to update the shared secret on the iServer side of things. And so making sure that, um, you know, just depending on what type of TACAX authentications are happening, that you don't accidentally lock yourself out because it's, you get a mismatch of the shared secret. So you can come in here and say retire. So retiring a shared secret, uh, sorry, actually I need to, um, I think I need to, so if I remember right, type the new one. So uh, right now it's currently ndojo123. That's what, the, what it has been. Let's say I want um, CCIW. Hey, get back here. CCIW123. So CCIW123, uh, let's hit retire. So do we want to retire the current TACX shared secret? Yes. And then let's hit save. And let's, let's take a look and see if it, if it keeps it. So... CCIEW123 is there, but because I retired uh, the previous one, we should be able to use ndojo123 still. And that's what my network device will be configured for. So we'll see if it works uh, with ndojo123. And then I could update it uh, to use CCIEW123 as well. And so there'll, there'll be this period of time where we can use both the old shared secret 
and the new shared secret. So feature that's not available in the Radius world is available in the TACX world. Um, enable password for admin users. So we're going to need some user accounts to authenticate TACX against. Uh, it could be Active Directory, but it also could be internally here on the, uh, the internal users here on the iServer. So with the internal users, if we go over to that, so let's say I want to use ice user one in some of my TACX configurations here. And I'll, I'll do both of them actually. So I, I've already done this in the past here, but um, the enable password, that's where this can come into play. Uh, but it's going to be for a specific use case, but I'll, I'll populate it. Uh, let's make sure I type this right. And dojo123 and dojo123. So not only do I have the login password, but now I additionally have an enable password. And this will be, okay, let's complain that I'm trying to save a, a password that I've already configured. This will be used with, um, if we want to enforce maximum privilege levels, and we'll see that when we get to the policies here. And I've already done it for here. So I have configured an enable password. It's endojo123, which is the same as the login password, but it doesn't have to be the same. It could be a different password than the login password. Uh, but we'll only ever use this on the TACX side. And again, for one specific use case that may never show up in the lab. Um, but I'll, I'll demonstrate this uh, use case in the future here. So that's another uh, thing that might be uh, extra config to support TACX here. Uh, the rest of it is going to be mainly under the TACX config itself. And so we're going to go under work centers to device administration. So this is going to be our, our TACX based configs. And we'll see a lot of reuse of things. When, when we use these work centers, oftentimes they pull menus and, and pages from a lot of different places that you can get to through other means too. So for instance, we can see internal users here, we can see internal identity groups, we can see our network resources. So uh, you could sort of do everything under this, you know, template of pages, you can get to it however it is that you want. But some of the unique things underneath here, let's, let's take a look. Uh, if we go to the overview, um, and go to deployment, we can see, looks like this might be another way of turning on TACX on the servers here. Uh, but down here is, is the port. So if we ever want to support TACX on any port besides 49, we would have to come in here and we can either say, you know what, I'm only supporting TACX on port 50, or maybe it's port 49 and port 50. I think you can specify up to four ports here if I remember right. Uh, yep, so comma separated list, uh, up to four entries. So now I could support TACX on, on either one of these ports. So Either they might ask you to do something like this, or potentially they could cause troubleshooting by removing 49 and replacing it with some other random number. All right, but that's a, it's kind of an important one there because that could absolutely break things if you didn't know about that one. Um, but let's take a look at the policy sets first and then we'll look into the, the policy elements. So unlike Radius, policy sets are always turned on with TACX. There's no such thing as turning it on or off. And so we always have this policy set view um, with TACX, whereas uh, with Radius, we can turn it on and turn it off. So it's, it's irrelevant what you've configured Radius to be. TACX is just always going to show this. But we just have the one policy by default. It's the default policy. And so everything's going to match that by default. And that's probably all you'll ever need, although you, you can create separate policies if you really want to, but probably don't need to do that. Uh, if we take a look at the default policy by clicking onto it, very much like uh, on the radius world where you're going to see an authentication policy and an authorization policy uh, housed within here. The authentication policy is going to look very similar to the authentication policy we saw in the radius world. So uh, we just have a default rule in this case, but what does it ask, you know, what does it specify? Uh, the allowed protocols list to use and then what user ID stores to leverage. And so there's, you know, the, the types of things we're already used to. So by default, it's going to use this allow protocols list called default device admin, which we'll take a look at that in a minute. And then it's going to use the all user ID store identity source sequence, which is shared with what we would use for radius as well. So tweak these if needed, you know, if they only want to use internal users for authentications, you could go ahead and tweak that here. 
and say internal users only, uh, we could use external users only, or identity store sequences, whatever it is. So uh, same type of flexibility here that we saw with the radius authentication profile. And then down below we have uh, our authorization rules, and I've already added a couple of them here. But uh, normally we would start with just the default rule that denies everything. We could change that, but deny is not a bad idea for management. We probably don't want to allow any management auth uh, possible. And then we would create our own rules that have matching conditions that are formatted the same where there's the, we can match on internal user or endpoint, uh, sorry, will it be internal user groups here. And then we have the right hand side where we can create our own custom conditions to our heart content, heart's content. Uh, and then the only difference is that rather than just having, you know, an authorization profile as the result, like we see in radius, we have uh, two things that we can return. Uh, number one, a command set and number two, shell profiles. So shell profiles are very much like our authorization profiles. Uh, the command sets are specifically for uh, allowing or denying individual commands or types of commands on our devices. I don't think that we'll ever get to that, but we'll look at them just so that you're aware of where they are and sort of what they look like. And so we, we also have the exception rules up above. So the, the policy structure itself looks very similar to radius, so we won't really uh, talk about this in any more detail. But let's go over to the policy elements. Conditions, probably not super important. Uh, let's go to the results though. These are the things that you're going to be mainly working with. So on the allowed protocol side, there's probably nothing that you'll ever need to do here, but uh, this default device admin, this is uh, one sort of set aside specifically for TACX, and it's very, it's very small. These are the only protocols allowed, and PAP ASCII and all our devices, uh, sorry, TACX and all our devices will use PAP ASCII. So uh, make sure allow PAP ASCII is turned on, and we won't ever have a problem with the allowed protocols list. Uh, command sets. So command sets, again, uh, these are for Let's say that uh, we're mainly like an, on an iOS device first. So our switches and our autonomous APs would be the only things that I'm aware of that would support the command set. I don't know that our AirOS does. Um, but basically what you could do here is you could say, you know what, uh, I don't want you to be able to use every command out there. I only want you to use, you know, these commands. So you can, you know, maybe use show commands. You could maybe, you know, configure interfaces. You could create VLANs but you know, basically a, a subset of, of the commands that you're allowed to do. And so by default, there's this deny all commands that denies every command uh, possible. Probably don't want that. Um, like I say, I, I don't think that we'll ever use this in the lab. And you don't technically have to call these out in your policies. And even if you do call it out, uh, you still have to configure your device to ask permission for command authorization. So if you don't do that, it's irrelevant what this is. But let's just say that we want to know how to create a, a command set that just allowed all commands, if you just want to be extra safe or something like that. So it's as simple as you know, hitting add, and I've already added it, so I'll edit it this one. But we're just going to give it a name. And then normally we would create a list of commands down here to say this is what I want you to do. But we have this option right here that says permit any command that is not listed below. All we do is check this box, leave this list blank, and so nothing's listed below, meaning everything's permitted. And we hit save. So give it a name, check this box, don't put anything on the list, save. Now you have your permit all command set. And again, it's probably not required, but if you want to be safe, sure, throw it in there. But you don't have to. The main thing then that we're going to deal with would be the TACX profiles because the allowed protocols list is good by itself. We probably don't need a command set. Um, but the profiles, that's definitely what we're going to need to configure to say this is the type of access you should get to whatever device it is that we're trying to log into. Now by default, there are these four profiles already there. And a couple of them are actually useful to us. Uh, one of them is giving read-write access to a controller. One of them is getting read-only access to a controller, AirOS-based controller. We might be able to, to use those. These may or may not be there at the beginning of the lab, so it just depends on if they delete these from you, for you or not. But let's go ahead and take a look at things. So I have this one. Let's focus on iOS devices first, and then we'll look at our AirOS devices and then Prime. So at the iOS level, 
we get, uh, this is our interface here, and it's sort of similar to the, the authorization profile interface in that we get this common tasks view right here to allow us easy configurations for common things that we might do. And then down below, we get the custom attributes where we can do our own nitty gritty configurations that might not be in the command task or common task, sorry. If you actually wanna see what it's going to send, you can switch over to raw view and you can edit things here too. So if you ever wanna just like do a quick copy paste, usually we do the copy paste into a raw view. We'll, we'll see how that's helpful when it comes time for PI. But these would be the results that it's actually going to send. So back to here. In the common task type, we have um, a few different sort of common task uh, templates, if you wanna call it that. Shell would be what we use for iOS based devices. WLC would be what we use for controllers. And for PI, we're just gonna copy paste, so it's kind of irrelevant for that. So Shell, this is what we're gonna use for our iOS based devices. And we should only ever probably deal with default privileges, maybe a small chance maximum privileges. So here, if you remember back in the, the network infrastructure series of videos, when we're creating management users, we talked about giving you know, privilege level 15 for you know, immediate uh, privilege exec mode, enable mode access, and a privilege level one would drop you off in uh, user mode. Uh, yeah, user, uh, the user interface where you, you have to get into enable mode. Uh, so it's the same two num you know, the same numbers that we're dealing with here. So one drops you off in user exec mode, 15 drops you off in privileged exec mode there. And so where do we want to start? But then we can also enforce a maximum. So usually we don't, we need to worry about the maximum. If we start them in 15, that's as high as they can go. So there's, there's no point in, in enforcing a maximum. But if we start them in one and we don't want them to get into enable mode, we can enforce a maximum privilege of one. And so uh, what we're gonna do is we, we would configure the device is that when they type in the enable command, it's gonna check against TACAS to say, uh, should this person get enable mode access? And then ICE can say yes or no. That's the maximum privilege level there. So I'll show you this so I can actually demonstrate the maximum privilege level, but um, like I say, this is, should be hopefully as advanced as you ever get. There's other options here and they're kind of interesting options, but I don't think that we should hopefully ever have to worry about these. Okay, so I've created this one that has a default privilege of one, a maximum privilege of one, and then I have another iOS-based one that will give us default one, but maximum of 15. And uh, that's just to demonstrate that uh, we can, you know, enforce this maximum privilege here. But usually I would just start it at 15 if I just want full read write access right from the get go. So I could create a, a completely another one to, to support this, but um, this is good enough for demonstration purposes here. Okay, and then once we have these, we can create our rule. So in the policy set, I have actually a couple of rules created and these are primarily, I'm gonna be testing this against autonomous AP. So um, in the first rule, if they log in with a group, uh, a user in the internal group, ICE group one, and the auth is coming from an autonomous AP, we're gonna send the iOS priv one, which has the maximum privilege level of one. If they log in with the user in ICE group two uh, on an autonomous AP, we're gonna give them one to begin with, but we'll allow them the maximum of 15. And then if it doesn't match one of those two things, we're gonna deny it. All right, so hopefully this, this policy makes a little bit of sense. Uh, let's go ahead and show you it in action. So I suppose I need my autonomous AP here. What do I have so far? Show run, section AAA, tech X. Okay, so I have done some work already, so yay me. So we've got AAA turned on. I defined a TACAC server called Ice-T. I created a server group, a TACAC server group called Ice-T that references the server name Ice-T. And now uh, here we go. So authentication login default group Ice-T and authorization exec default group Ice-T. I'm gonna get rid of this guy here because I don't need that one. So these are configurations that you've hopefully seen in previous videos, um, nothing too wild uh, or different from what I've done before. The, the big difference here that I haven't shown you before is this AAA authentication enable default group ICE-T. 
This is the one that you need if you want to enforce a maximum privilege. But if there's no need to enforce a maximum privilege, then we don't need this line here. Now, another point about this. If we do want to enforce a maximum privilege, not only do we need this command, but we also have to populate the enable passwords in our internal users. Otherwise, what will happen is it's going to do an auth check when we say enable, because I'm going to say enable. It'll ask me for a password. I type in the password. It sends the username and then the enable password that I typed in, and it's going to try to match that against the, the enable password configured under the internal user. If that enable password is blank, it'll actually cause an auth failure. So that's the use case where you need to populate the enable password underneath the internal user inside of ICE. But without trying to enforce a maximum privilege, then the enable password in the ICE user is completely irrelevant. We just need the login password for that. Okay, so this is the, the config that we would need. Let's go ahead and try to, um, to test this out. And actually, to avoid these silly scrolling logs, uh, let me do it from another switch. So I'll just tell net if I type it right, 10.09.101. So tell net to Thomas AP1. So I'll log in under uh, ICE user 1. So this user will have the initial privilege level of 1 and a maximum privilege level of 1. And so if I try to get into enable mode, it should block me. Okay, I get this error in authentication. Let's take a look at the auth log. Flip over to the TACX live logs. And these will be the, the logs. So we have separate logs for TACX than we did for Radius, but it's going to look similar to what we saw in the Radius world. And we look, when we look at the details, it'll be similar there. Okay, so here was my initial login. So one unique thing with the TACX is we get pretty much two entries every time. There's an authentication entry and a separate authorization entry. So the first time I logged in, I auth with uh, ICE user 1. It hit the, the default policy set, the default authentication rule, um, and then the default identity store rule within that. And so if we take a look at these, it'll look very similar to our radius logs. Not quite as much information in here, but very similar lists of information. So the authentication policy I hit, what was the um, selected authorization profile that I received, iOS priv 1. So again, we can see where the auth is coming from, network device groups, locations in play. We see that we are doing PAP ASCII as our authentication method down below. And our, our you know, stuff about you know, finding the identity, since it was an identity store sequence, we see the selected identity stores down here. We see the group that my user was found in, since it was a local group. Um, so similar types of information inside here. And then we have the authorization entry after that. And this is going to be a little bit of a reiteration of the, the authorization phase of things. And so again, I see the shell profile that we returned, some more similar types of information. Uh, this is the response that it actually sent. So it sent a privilege level of one. Notice it didn't send the maximum privilege level because we weren't querying for that but uh, otherwise a similar types of information. Okay, so that was my initial login. This is then for my attempt to get into enable mode. And so if we take a look at the details here. So since I configured my AP to do an auth when we type in uh, an enable password, it sent an, a check up to the server. And here we see the, the fail was because the requested privilege level is too high. I can't remember if we maybe look at this detail here. We'll get the running log. Yep. So we see we're evaluating the authorization policy. Requested privilege level too high. We see a similar thing to here. So that's what we're, that's what we're seeing here. Uh, and it's correctly limiting our maximum privilege level. Now, if I log out and log back in with the other user, ICE user 2, again, I start at privilege level 1 because that was the, the config, but now when I do an enable, 
it lets me get through. So again, we're going to see a couple of entries in our logs here. One pair of entries for the initial authentication, and then this is the authentication on the enable. So this time, we, uh, we did uh, pass the, the check and we were allowed to go ahead and get into a privilege level 15. So we can see it was uh, authentication privilege level 15 was, was referenced inside there. And we said yes, basically we said you're allowed to do that. So that should be about it here. Um, and again, if you want to start immediately into enable mode, you just do the initial privilege level at 15. And once you're there, there's no sense in even bothering to enforce a maximum privilege level. You're already there. Okay, so that would be uh, configuring a policy to support iOS-based authentications. And this would also be the policy whether you want to get into the CLI or if you want to get into the GUI of an iOS-based device. But if you want to get into the GUI of an autonomous AP, which should be the only thing that we have to care about, um, just make sure that we give them privilege level 15. Privilege level 1 doesn't give us read-only GUI access. It just doesn't give us GUI access at all. We have to be privilege level 15 for that to work. All right, let's look at policies for AeroS-based devices. Um, where do I want to go? I want to go back into Policy Elements, Results, TACX Profiles. So if we create um, a, a new one here, we see uh, WLC. It switches up our common task, and this is perfect for what we need. So here are our options. We can either give full read-write access to everything, we can give read-only access to everything. We can give lobby access to the user to give us a special lobby interface. Or the selected ones here basically says, whatever we check, we get read-write access to. Whatever we don't check, we get read-only access to. And this matches up to the top-level menu tabs. If I go to a uh, controller here, and get past this. So these, so basically if I say WLANs and controller, I can get read-write access to everything under WLANs, everything under controller, and then everything else I'm going to get read-only access to. So we can do sort of a, a menu by menu read-write option. But those are our options. So again, read-write to everything, read-only to everything, special lobby interface, and then uh, per menu item read-write access. So I'll show you this one because it's kind of unique. Inside here, I'll call it WLC custom, submit, and then I'll add a rule to my policy. I'll add it towards the bottom. So I'll call it AROS custom. All right, so I'll say if they're in that ice group one and it's coming from an AeroS device. And with TACX, this is kind of like the way that you do all your rules. If it's in this group, whether it be an internal group or an external group, and if it's coming from this type of device or this individual device or these devices, uh, do something. All right, what am I looking for? Device. Device type. There's not a whole lot of other matching that we typically do on a TACX policy. So I'm going to leave the command set blank, and I'll just call it the shell profile. Uh, what do I want here? WLC custom. Done. Save. Let's make sure that I have a TACX server in this, which, nope. So let me do this real quick. 10.0.1.5 and Dojo123. And don't forget to do both the authentication and the authorization. We need both. Otherwise, with authentication only, you'll get logged in, but you'll always just have read-only access to everything. It's the authorization that gives us the extra. Okay. Authentication, authorization, go to my priority order, get TACX over here, bye-bye radius. All right. So let's log in. ICE user 1. And Dojo123. Did 
Did I type right? MD OJ O one two three. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, what did I do wrong here? When in doubt, check the logs. Possibly mismatch shared secrets. Well, oh, okay. So maybe I did it wrong on the retiring the shared secret because I updated it right, and I thought I hit, hit the did the retire correctly, but. Uh, maybe not. Uh, there's a setting, I, th I think, over here for, yeah, the default shared secret retirement. So this is supposed to allow that uh, retired shared secret to be valid for seven, up to seven days. Uh, but let me just fix this up here. I say say ndojo123, let's say retire. And now let's, what does it say when I... There we go, now it's active. Now it shows me this retired shared secret is active. I must have just misclicked a button or something like that. So right now the main shared secret is ndojo123 and we can see the retired shared secret is ndojo123. All right. I'm going to put this back to, to CCIW123. So now I have uh, a shared secret of CCIW123, but I have the retired shared secret of ndojo123. So both of these are valid. So even though the active shared secret is not a match, the retired shared secret is, and then we should see this work. Nice user1, ndojo123. There we go. But if I don't update this um, in the next seven days, this is going to start breaking. Okay, so I should be able to make changes underneath here. So how about I just uh, enable a WLAN. That worked. Can I make a, a tweak here? This worked. Can I change something under wireless? Um, Uncheck a box. Nope. So read, write to WLANs and controllers. Everything else sh should be read only. All right, finally, prime infrastructure, configuring a policy for that. So it's going to be a, a similar process to what we saw with the radius side of things, where we need to grab a bunch of information from the server. But this time, we can copy paste, which is great. Um, so let's say admin, sorry, not admin, root. So we're going to go back under the same place that we saw back in the radius management auth, where the administration, users, roles, and AAA. And we're going to go, uh, I suppose we can create a TACAC server. And again, we'll look at this uh, again, the, the, the prime side of the configuration again when we get to, to PI videos. 5, port 49. Save. Go to our AAA mode settings. We'll flip it over to using TACX for authentications. And then we need to, the, the policy. So user groups, again, we're going to model this after a user group. I'll do the lobby ambassador again. So we go over to the task list of the group that we want to give access to. And now I just copy everything. Roles plus the tasks. I go back into uh, my ICE server. Where do I want to go? Work centers. Back to my policy elements. Call it PI lobby. And I can just go right to the raw view. Paste. Uh, I also need the virtual domain. So we have to have uh, at least one virtual domain, one role, and then one or more tasks is, is what we need at the end of the day. Whereas the radius, we, we want the virtual domain and the role, but we didn't need the task because of this feature that it talks about up there. So I'm going to jump to the virtual domains here, making sure I grab the TACX side of things. And I always put virtual domain at the top. So I just go virtual domain, role, and then tasks. All right, so copy, paste, save yourself a whole lot of time. Submit. 
Oh, PI lobby TAC for TAC X is complaining. I was using uh, a uh, profile I was used somewhere else, which was probably on the radius side of things. Okay, uh, now I just need a rule. And we'll go down here. And actually, you know what? I don't have PI defined separately, I don't think. So I'm just going to put it at the top just to, to match it. And I'm just going to say if it's a specific user group. Just to show you the policy working is really what I'm looking for. Uh, I don't need command sets. I need the shell profile. PI lobby. Done. Save. Yes, I know this breaks other things. This is purely for demonstration purposes. All right, well, let's log out, log back in, and see what happens. Ice user one and Dojo one, two, three. And we log in. We're in the lobby ambassador interface. We see we're in the root domain. We're logged in with ice user one. So there would be the policy for um, a, a PI based server. And, and these, that's everything. It'll either be a, a switch or an autonomous AP, which is the iOS process. It'll be uh, a 5508 controller, virtual wireless LAN controller, or mobility express controller, which uses the, the WLC process. Uh, the only difference on mobility express, I believe, is we might not do the, the conditional one that we saw, but we can definitely give full read write, full read only. Uh, those two definitely will work, probably not lobby as well. And then we have the PI based uh, policies. So these are the things, I guess, uh, to understand, make sure that you know how to configure everything needed to support all these different policies, understand you know, how to turn on the TACAC service and where it can be turned on for that. Uh, if they want to get into retiring a shared secret, understand that you can retire it. Here's where we set the time period for the retiring shared secret. Most of the stuff we probably, the other stuff under here, we probably don't need to worry about too much. Understand the, the policy part. You know, it's, uh, it's very similar to the policy structure of radius with policy sets turned on. Other than that, um, hopefully that's all we'll ever need to know about TACX.